Okay, so Matthew 2, and today we think about uh, the festival that's called Epiphany, where we think about the Magi coming to Jesus, and you'll see the crib is up, it's the final week it'll be up, it's been, the picture has been building over Christmas, and very often we lump um, the three wise men or the kings in with the Christmas story, but actually it is a separate um, festival and a separate part of the story and happens sometime later. So what can we learn from this this morning? Well, before we get into the passage, I want you to just imagine and think a little bit about the year that lies ahead for you as we start a new year together, 2017, what lies ahead for you? And perhaps there are some things you're really excited about this coming year. Um, imagine them a bit like a kind of big box full of treasure because we have that image in our reading. And you, there might be some jewels this year, things that you're really looking forward to, that you're really excited about, that you're treasuring, that you know are going to happen. Maybe um, something exciting in terms of relationships or, um, I don't know, becoming a grandparent or a new job or a holiday you've got planned. Something Thing that is a jewel, some jewels in your treasure box of this year. And then there are other things this year that are just kind of like the gold coins, which, you know, would be quite exciting, but they're just the bread and butter, really. They're just the kind of ordinary things in that treasure chest of the year. Um, you know, the daily things that you'll do, um, the chores, the ongoing relationships, um, the work that you do, whether that's paid or unpaid. Those are some of the things. And then perhaps there are some dark corners. Perhaps there's a spider or two lurking in your treasure chest. Perhaps there's a bit down the bottom where something's gone a bit mouldy and you're not quite sure what is in that aspect. Jill's grinning at the thought of the mouldy corner with the spider in it. Claire? Oh, okay. <laughs> Just, I was thinking, oh my word, what have I said? Um, but yes, yeah, so there'll be some of those areas down at the bottom, the things that you're worried about this year, the things that make you feel fearful, the question marks you've got. And of course, none of us really knows what lies ahead this year, do we? we we've got these things that we hope for, that we long for, that we dream about, but actually none of us quite knows what lies ahead in this coming year. So I want you to hold that image. There it is. It's a really lovely, I think that's a crafted treasure chest that somebody's made on Pinterest probably. But anyway, what does 2017 hold? We don't know, but imagine your year ahead is like that treasure chest. And now let's pull out some questions from our passage that help us to think about what we're going to do this year as we think about it. So first question that I think springs out of this passage really is who is the true king? Who is the true king? We think about the Magi sometimes as being kings, but we don't know if they were. And we hear about the king that's been born and we hear about the political king, Herod. And Herod hears the news of this baby who's been born and he reacts really strongly with anger, suspicion, distrust. Now, Herod is a certifiable um, historical figure. There's a picture, a couple of pictures of him, some sort of likeness of him. And um, he was at times quite a good king. I don't know if you know this about him, but he did actually do some quite good things, kind of politically. Uh, he was quite generous. He didn't overtax the people. When there was a famine, he paid for food for the poor out of his own coffers. Um, and he managed to maintain stability in that region over a couple of decades in sort of political terms, worldly terms. He was quite a good king. He was also um, paranoid and possibly a psychopath. I don't, I'm kind of qualified to whether I use those terms correctly or not. But he did murder quite a lot of members of his own family because he was so insecure and he didn't want them um, fighting him for the throne. Uh, he murdered many respected citizens of Jerusalem to kind of guard his position. And we know that following on from the passage that we heard read, that actually he had this, he had many baby boys slaughtered across Jerusalem. So a bit of a mixture, really, Herod. So is he the true king? Was he the true king? Who is the true king in this story? Now, I don't think any of us want to be too identified with Herod. We don't want to think, oh, I'm a bit like Herod. But there is one way in which we are all quite like Herod, I think. And it is this question of who is the true king? Because Herod wants to be king. He doesn't want Jesus to be king. He wants to be on the throne himself. And don't we all feel a bit like at times in our own lives? Don't we all want 
to run our own lives. There's a throne. We want to be on our own throne. We like to feel that we're in control. And as you thought about your treasure chest of the year to come, I expect most of us have quite a lot of aspects of that that we think, but I want to make those choices. I want to have the freedom to decide what I'm going to do. I want to make my own plans. I've got my own ambitions and hopes for this year. And I want to be in charge of it. I want to be on So who is the true king? Because if we say that we're Christians, then what that means is we have to get off our own throne and we have to allow Jesus to be on the throne instead. We have to take off the crown and present it to him. He is the true king. And that is a struggle for every single one of us at times and for some perhaps more than others. Some of us don't even like being in the passenger seat of a car, never mind in the passenger seat of our lives. But who is the true king? If Jesus is the true king, will we get off the throne this year and let him be in charge? So that's my first challenge, our first question really. Second question that I want to bring out of this passage, um, and this is a slightly more cryptic one, who is in the corner? Who is in the corner? You'll understand what I mean in a minute. Um, The Pharisees, no, not the Pharisees, the scribes and the teachers of the law. Now, they're mentioned in here, aren't they? The the scribes and the priests, the chief priests. And and there they are. They are diligent. Uh, They know the scriptures really well. They know where the king is to be born. They know it's Bethlehem. They know that's the right answer. But they're not really interested. You know, they're not they're not fascinated by this. They're not captivated by it. They don't say, oh, God's Messiah, the one that was predicted 400, 600, 800, several thousand years ago, is born in Bethlehem. We'd better go and find out about this. They're like, yes, that's the right answer. Tick the box. They're Herod's yes men. They need to please him, obviously. They've got to keep their heads down. Probably not easy working for Herod. Quite scary, I would imagine. They want to keep their jobs. They want to earn their money. They want to maintain the status quo. They know the right answer, but they're just indifferent. And sometimes we can be like that. We know the right answers, but we're not making the connection. So why have I questioned this? Who is in the corner? Well, um, my sister, Alex, did a started doing a PhD. She never finished it, actually. She's an educationalist. Can I have the next slide up, Gareth? Thank you, but not the next one yet. Um, And part of her research was about how do children, primary school-age children, how do they learn science? And so for her, as part of her research, she got lots and lots of school children to draw pictures a bit like this. What does the solar system look like? Because they would learn that in science at school. And they'd draw these lovely pictures, a bit like the one that you can see, and there's the sun, and there's the different planets all in order, and they go around the sun. And and the children kind of got that. And some of them would also draw the moon going around the earth, because they'd understood that, and they'd learnt it from science. And, uh, you know, and there they were. They'd got all this knowledge. And then she would say to them, now draw yourself, where are you in this picture? And almost out, without fail, they would draw it like this. Oh, I'm standing in the corner because I've learned it in science and it's all happening somewhere. It's nothing to do with me. That's what the scribes and the chief priests do. Oh, I've got all this knowledge. I'm just standing in the corner watching it. Where should you draw yourself? You should draw yourself on planet Earth, shouldn't you? If you kind of really get it. Now, that's no reflection on primary school teachers because it's what we all do. We're very good, perhaps, at knowing the right answers, singing along with the worship songs, reading our Bibles, getting knowledge, getting understanding. But will we let it impact our lives this year? Will we get out of the corner and into the picture? Will we get involved in what God is doing in our own lives, in the lives of our communities, in the life of our church? Because as we start a new year together, it's an adventure, isn't it? There's so much going on. Will we get involved? Will we make a difference? 
And that might be within the life of the church. It might be beyond these, it certainly will be beyond these walls and out into the community. But some of the things that are going on this year, the building is going to continue to change. Um, There's new members of staff like Helen. It's only a year since Jill started. Can you believe that? It feels like, Jill, you've been part of the furniture for a long time in a really good way. We love having you here. Um, New members of staff, things growing, lots more of everybody else getting involved in leadership because as the church grows we need to take responsibility and and do stuff and get involved in stuff. Um, Small groups are going to have a bit of a shake-up later in this year. Um, There's all kinds of things going on in Marlow Bottom if you want to know about them come and talk to me or Graham about them. There's a whole new church growing there which is really exciting and things are changing across this team, across this town, in this church. Are we just knowing about it because we read it on the notice sheet and we're just in the corner? Or are we actually going to step into it and get involved? Now, change is a bit uncomfortable. And you might feel uncomfortable about change that's coming in your life or in the life of this church. And and that's okay. That is part of being alive, that change can be uncomfortable. It can challenge us. But let's not make that put us more in the corner. Let's let that make us more dependent on God and getting involved in what he's doing, in what's going on. Let's pray. What do you want me to do, Lord? What part do you want me to play? Don't be content to be like the scribes and the chief priests sitting in the corner. So, who is the true king? Who is in the corner? And final question, who is risking everything? Who in the story risked everything? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? It was the Magi. Now, we know and we don't know about these people. They were mysterious. They were wise. They were holy men. They probably weren't kings, as I've said already. And yet they recognized something in the rising of a star that they knew had the utmost importance and they were prepared to risk everything. They come to Herod and look at verse 2. Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews. The king of the Jews. Now that's the first time that that phrase is used in Matthew's gospel and it gets used once more. Anybody know when the second time it gets used is? On the cross, at the crucifixion. They come looking for the king of the Jews who is going to be nailed to a cross. Myrrh. They know that there is death involved in this birth. They know that there is a sacrifice to come. Myrrh was used to anoint dead bodies. They risk everything. Jesus, the king of the Jews, and yet king of so much more than the Jews, as these foreign strangers come to worship him. And I've chosen this image of pushing all your chips. Are they called chips? I really actually know nothing about casinos, but I've watched quite a lot of movies. Um, They push all their chips into the center of the table and they say, we will risk everything. And I'll put my car keys and my house keys and the deeds to my mortgage and everything onto the table for him. They come bringing their treasure. Will we bring our treasure? Will we bring our hopes and fears for 2017 and push them all into the centre of the table, even the dark corners with the spiders, and say, here is my time, my money, my talents, my problems, my hopes, my aspirations. Will we give him our hearts? Will we risk everything like the Magi? Because they had to leave house and home, they travel, they must have left their families behind, they risk international diplomacy, they risk personal safety, and they bring things of great value. Will we risk everything this year? And I love the word homage. It comes three times in that passage. Um, It comes in verse 2, and then Herod uses it in his slightly phony way in verse 8. And then it's used again of the Magi as they come in in verse 11. They knelt down and paid him homage. It's a very old-fashioned word. I don't think I ever use it in everyday language. Maybe you do. Maybe you live in the medieval part of Marlow. Who knows? Um, But 
what is homage? Well, it's about reverence and respect. It's about worship and obedience. But it's also what a slave had to pay to their master. So if you were what's called a vassal in feudal times, I said it's the medieval part, it showed that you were the servant. You were um, contracted by a bond greater than we can really think of in terms of employment. You know, it's much bigger than that. Homage shows that you are the bondman, bondsman or the bondswoman of the Lord in question. And in this case, the Magi risk everything to come to Jesus, to pay him homage. So will we bring our treasure chests this year to Jesus with everything in them? And will we say, you are Lord, you are the true king. I want to be involved in what you're doing rather than off in the corner. And I'm prepared to risk everything for you this year. Will we do that? Let's pray. I'm going to use a prayer uh, that Dave drew to my attention, drew to our attention recently. And it's an old prayer. It's a prayer of Sir Francis Drake. And I think it's a fabulous prayer to start the new year. So think about these words and pray along with them in your hearts if you want to take that risk this year. Disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves. When our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little when we arrive safely because we have sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. When in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas where storms will show your mastery, where, losing sight of land, we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push into the future in strength, courage, hope and love. In Christ's name, amen. And let's just continue in prayer, thinking beyond. I invite you, first of all, to pray for the people sitting perhaps on your right and your left or in front and behind you. You may or may not know their names, but pray a blessing on them. And now let's think beyond these walls to where we will be this time tomorrow, in a workplace, in a home, in a club, alone with a computer or in a group of people. Let us pray God's blessing over all that network of relationships. Let's think of our town, so abundantly blessed, and yet with many needs as well. Let's pray for a blessing on our town, but also ask God to push us to that place of risk this year in our community. Let's pray for our country and our government, both local and national. And for the nations of the world. 
as the Magi came representing different countries and opening up the gates of God's kingdom so that all, all could be included. So we pray for the nations of the world. Lord, we lift our prayers to you and we offer you the treasure chests of all of our hopes and fears, our hearts, our lives for this coming year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.